here we go. To begin with, let me say um, what a delight and what a privilege it is to be here. And thank you very much. And, uh, God has done me a big favour this day. Before I get into uh, a lot of what I want to say here, let me make these two remarks. Those of you, by the way, who've heard me speak before will recognise I'll, I'll be no doubt saying some of the same things and bringing out some of the same stories. That's because the topic is God. And therefore, um, there's always going to be some overlap. See, none of us right now are here by accident. This moment right now has been ordained by our loving Father forever. So there are things right now that God wants to say to you that thus far it hasn't been time for him to say. But right now, roughly 25 past nine at Stanwall Tops on the 11th of December 2021, God is now saying it's time. So the ears of your heart need to be open. But more than that, whether they're open or not, this is the moment God has chosen to give you something that you haven't had ever before. The second thing is that um, the aim of this interaction here, it's not about imparting any knowledge. It's about an experience of the love of God. If you and I don't leave this auditorium knowing and loving God more than we did when we walked in, then something's wrong. We're about the love of God. <coughs> Excuse me. So having made that very clear, that's what we're about. Now let's explore it. First thing I'd like you to do is uh, I'd like you to close your eyes. I'm inviting you to close your eyes. I'm simply going to speak some words now straight out of the scripture. And as I speak them, you see which words land on your heart. I tell you, do not be afraid. I am with you. Though your sins may seem as red as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. I hold you by your right hand. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I am with you. Can a mother forget her child? But even if she does, I will never forget you. You are precious in my eyes and I love you. Come to me, all you who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Though you walk through the bitter valley, I will be with you. Now just hold that word, don't open your eyes yet, hold that word and have a little 
half a minute, talk to God. What was it that you heard? What did he just give you? Just gently open your eyes. And hang on to that word. We'll come back to it later. So in, in, in this talk now, here's what I'd like to look at. I'd like to look at what is the interior life? What feeds the interior life? And what does the interior look like? What's it do for you? What will you discover? The first thing about the interior life is to say it's all about God. It's all about the God who lives within you. It's all about the God who is continually revealing himself to you. Now, that's important. Revealing himself to you in ways that you get. The person beside you mightn't get it the way you do. That doesn't matter. In ways that you get. And who is this God who is revealing himself to you? Well, let me tell you a story. And I have told this story before, too. Hey, by the way, how long am I supposed to speak for? <laughs> Can, um, I've got till 10. OK. Look, when we get to 10, will you jump up and down? Because by then, I'll be feeling sorry for you. So I have, I have a cousin who's deaf. Um... She's not that much younger than, than I, and so I was only a little kid when she was, she was born. And in those days, nobody understood. Well, they didn't have the technology and medical science at that time. Anyway, so Frances is born, and she's deaf. But they didn't, my aunt and uncle didn't know that she was deaf. They recognised that developmentally she wasn't the same as her brothers and sisters, but they didn't work out that she was deaf until one day when she was three, Uncle Brian let off a, an alarm clock at the back of her head and she didn't move. And they worked out, well, she's deaf. So they sought around to get the best advice possible and the best advice was send her to a special school for the deaf, which was the beautiful Dominican sisters up at Newcastle at that time. But she was only three. Anyway, poor Annie Dorothy, she got on the, f on the train with, with Francis and it's a fair distance from Eastwood to, to um, Newcastle in those days. Francis went to sleep on the way up and Annie Dorothy had to carry her from the railway station to the school. When they got there, she put Francis down and Francis kind of came to in, the, in this big, big, dark place and she clung to Auntie Dorothy because she was frightened but Auntie Dorothy had to leave her there which was just dreadful there was this poor kid surrounded by people she didn't know and she couldn't understand why was a mother walking away from her and again because she was deaf you couldn't tell her anyway the next day um Auntie Dorothy and Uncle Brian, they were just waiting for a proper time to, to ring the school and find out how she was. However, about seven o'clock the phone went and it was one of those beautiful nuns. She rang and she said, Mrs Scott, 
you'll be worried about Frances. Well, I'll tell you, she cried all night. But I want you to know that I sat on the bed and I held her and I cried with her. I've never forgot, I was only a little kid, but I've never forgotten that. And as I've got older, I recognise that's such a magnificent image of God. We do not cry on our own, never. We are tied up. The God who wishes to reveal himself to us is the God who sits on the bed and cries with us. And it doesn't matter. Sometimes you and I have got good reason to cry. We brought it on ourselves, but it never matters to God. You're upset. God's there. And so I'm saying to you, the interior life, that's the, 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 that, that's the territory, that's the landscape in which we discover who God is. The God who is with us. The God who sits on the bed and cries with us. The thing about this interior life, though, is that because it, it's really simple at the end of the day, it's really simple because it really is only about the life of God within you. It's a matter of how to access that life, though, how to get into touch with it. When Europeans first came to Australia, so many of them died, and they died of thirst, and heaven only knows what else. But one of the things they discovered about Australia was that it is the driest continent on Earth. It's drier than Africa. We can't support huge population because we haven't got the water. However, however, while Europeans were dying of thirst, our First Nation people weren't. And the reason they weren't is that they knew about the water underground. They knew how to tap into that water and they were fine. And so it is with us. So it is with us. All we got to do is know how to tap into that deeper life with God within us. And there's no reason on God's earth why any of us should die. Remind, it, it reminds me of that um, saying of um, St Ignatius of Antioch. I hear within me as from a spring of water the murmur. Come to the Father. Yeah. There's the call. Come to the Father. Tap into the interior life and you will hear the call of God to you. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That's the last section. So, what feeds the interior life? What feeds feeds the interior life to start with, is fill your life with the things of God. Like if I want to make a cake, and like who in their right mind doesn't want to make something that's full of cholesterol, sugar, <laughs> and wonderful life-giving ingredients. So if I want to make a cake, I don't go get a bowl and fill it with nails, screws... Uh, Tarzan's grip. <laughs> hey, cement, that'll hold it together. Um, whatever. I do that. I, can be pretty, I don't know what you'll get, but it won't be a cake. If you are looking for God in your life, if you want the interior life, then you need to fill your life with the things of God. Easy. As one of my sisters said to me just yesterday when I asked her to get the dinner, too easy, she said. <laughs> hmm. I thought, yeah, well, gee, that's great. 
too easy. I didn't think it was too easy, but I was glad she did. <laughs> so you get my point. Fill your life with the things of God. Don't bother wasting your time with the other stuff. Whatever you'll be creating, it's not going to be God. Furthermore, if you want the interior life, then an essential ingredient is prayer. And Sister Joanna Marie would have told you marvellous things yesterday or last night about prayer. So I'm, I'm not going to say a whole lot more except this. Excuse me, that's at least tuberculosis. <laughs> that's a joke, it's not. <clears throat> there is a line of communication between the soul and God. And it's happening right now. It's happening in you, it's happening in me. Now, you don't know what's going on, but it's happening. You're breathing right now. Have you given that any thought in the last two seconds? Of course you haven't. And yet you're breathing nonetheless. You know, think about the line of communication between yourself and God, but it's happening just the same. And it's a communication line of love. Now, God is in communication not only with you, but walk out into the bush there. God is in communication with every leaf on every tree, with every blade of grass, with every little petal on every little native violet that's all around the grass these days. On the day that God ceases to be in communication with any of them, they cease to exist. That's theological fact. On the day that God ceases to be in communication with you, it's all over Red Rover. You, you can't be found. Now, I am saying to you, that line of communication is prayer. Now, notice... I've said the line of communication between God and the soul. You haven't done anything yet except being on the receiving end. When you decide that you're going to respond to that communication line, then all you're doing is going online. Please note the technical language. You're going online. You might decide... That um, what you're going to say the rosary, you might decide to, decide to pick up the scriptures, you might decide to talk to God. It doesn't matter what you do. When you decide to respond, then bingo, the communication line really takes off. Prayer starts with God. It doesn't start with you. Now, this wouldn't apply to any of you, I know that, and it certainly doesn't apply to me, but sometimes one can even say, hey, God, listen, please. I just said the rosary. Now, there's no need to thank me, but, um, like, I was only too happy to do that. Oh, please. No, no, it's, it's fine, it's fine. Um, any little thing. No worries. Too easy. <laughs> or, hey God, um, listen, I just went to Mass. Now that's an hour if you take in travelling time. <laughs> and um, could I also point out it wasn't Sunday? But please, there's no need to thank me. <laughs> I know it was good of me. And I know you're just tickle pink. Well, whoopee-doo. What kind of communication was that? If you said the rosary because you were so grateful for the presence of God in your life, that's communication. If you went to Mass because life was just so incredibly difficult and you knew you needed the Eucharist, 
That's communication. The only favor I do God in prayer is by letting him know that I'm grateful for his love and I'm giving him permission to love me for the rest of my life. There's another thing to say about prayer. Pray as you can, not as you can't. It doesn't matter how you pray. It only matters that you do pray. Some people pray in their own way and then we look at them and we think, oh, gee whiz, they've got their life together. I should pray the way they do and it nearly kills you. Oh, waste of time. Don't pray their way. Pray your way. That's real communication. Furthermore, as I said, I, I won't say any more about prayer, but th it needs to be there. Furthermore, look, let there be some silence in your life. You know, while you're here, you've got a perfect opportunity. Go out into the bush and just stand there. Listen to the wind. Listen to the birds. Listen to the distant hum of the traffic. And what that will be doing while you're... And when you get in the car, don't fling the radio on straight away. Give yourself some quiet. Give yourself some silence. And while you're doing that, what you're doing is your whole heart, your soul, your whole being is becoming attuned, is becoming receptive to that still, small voice of God who loves to talk in whispers. Let there be silence in your life. Let there be the scriptures in your life. Now that's important. Our Holy Father St. Benedict as he says in the rule, he says, let... Oh, what's he say? Come on. Oh yes, I know what it is. <laughs> He says, take the gospel for your guide. In other words, have the scriptures permanently inside of you. You'll find out three things from your encounter with the scriptures. You'll find out who you are. You'll find out who God is. And you'll find out who you are together. See... Let's say you've got a block of sandstone. And even if I, I'm, I'm being prejudiced here, but I sometimes think there's nothing more beautiful than Sydney sandstone. Now, you get it everywhere else, but Sydney sandstone is really great. You see, they plough through Sydney sandstone to make roads. And if you look either side in the initial days, the colours are just stunning. Layer after layer. And the other feature of sandstone, as you know, and down here at the, at the water's edge you'll see it, when water continually rubs over it, it actually changes its shape, smooths away, turns it into a different look. See, that's what happens to your heart when you continually feed it with scripture. You're changed. And you know the best thing? You haven't been the architect of your own change. God has changed you. Now that's proper change. Furthermore, I said that if in encountering with the scriptures you'll get to see who you are and you will. You'll get to see the magnificent colours that are inside you. You'll get to see yourself for the wonderful human being God has created you to be. No matter what you think of yourself. And there'll be some of you sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, 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 wonderful colours in me, there aren't any. I'm saying to you, oh, yes, there are. Apply the scriptures and you'll discover them. Don't fall into the lie. It is a lie. It's a lie, the devil. It's a lie. If any of you have been convinced that there's something fundamentally flawed about you, that's garbage. It's a lie. 
And the only person who plants those kind of lies is the devil. Don't buy into it. Buy into the scriptures and be told the truth. You remember the story, that marvellous story of the, um, the, the woman caught in adultery. And, um, and you, know, you know how it runs. And, and Jesus begins, you know, playing around in the dirt. Um, and Jesus says, well, you know, um, hey, those of you without sin, well, by, you know, go for your life. Chuck the stones. Why you go. He didn't exactly say it like that, but he would have. <laughs> if he'd been in Australia, he would have. <laughs> <clears throat> and then marvellous, wonderful Jesus then plays around in the dirt. That's what you do with children. When you need them to do something important, you act as though it's, not, doesn't, it's no big deal. You're not even looking. And what happens? Those people faced themselves. And Jesus didn't jump up and down and eyeball them like we do when we're mad with somebody. <laughs> I'll let you know how cross I am. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. Neither did he stand up and say, hey, Joe Bloggs, hello, what about your life? Oh, come on. <laughs> no, none of that. He left them to sort it for themselves and they did and they went away. They went away from that encounter knowing themselves better than they did on the day they picked up the stones to throw at the woman. It's what scripture will do for you and me. It's, not, it's what scripture does. Everybody was a winner in that story. The other thing is moving right along. The other thing is make sure there's some decent, this is an aside, make sure there's some decent reading in your life. Don't fill your life with garbage. Uh, fill your life with garbage and you can expect to find yourself on the tip somewhere. No. Fill your life with the decent sort of stuff. Now, there's one other thing that's essential Absolutely essential if you want to tap into the interior life. And that, now get ready, hold on to your seats because this isn't pleasant. You've actually got to surrender. You really do need to abandon yourself to God. And straight away when I say that, something inside us says, no, 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 no. I abandon myself to God. What will he do? <coughs> well, all he'll do is love you, but you don't know that right now. Hello? That's God saying, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a terrific story told of the, uh, a doll that was made of salt. So this doll goes down to the the ocean, and she says to the ocean, who are you? And the ocean says, well, put your foot in. Oh, so she puts her foot in, of course it dissolves, she's made of salt. And uh, she said, yeah, well, I still don't know who you are. Well, I'll come in up to your waist. Yeah, does that, but I still don't know who you are. Come in up to your neck. Yeah, but I still don't know who you are. Put your head under the water. And then the little voice went over the waves. Ah, now I know who you are. You're me. You will know that there is no fine line, believe it or not, between the divine and the human. But you'll only know that if you are Abandon yourself to God. And there's really, really simple ways of doing that. May I suggest that every single one of you begin your day with a simple prayer of abandonment. There's a little beauty from Charles de Foucault. 
the um, French hermit. In truth, I say it every day myself. Father, I abandon myself into your hands. Do with me what you will, and whatever you may do, I thank you. I am ready for all I accept all. Let only your will be done in me and in all your creatures. I ask no more than this. Into your hands I abandon my soul. I give it to you with all the love in my heart, for I love you, Father, and so need to give myself without reserve and with boundless confidence, for you are God, my Father. There are loads of little ways. A simple first thing in the morning, Father, I give you myself today. I give myself to you today. Real simple. There are other ways that you can abandon yourself. Part of the abandoning is this whole business of losing yourself. That's not popular either. So I'm not really giving you any good news here. It's essential if you want the interior life. It's essential that bit by bit you lose yourself like the salt dog. So here's where you begin. You don't have to do it all at once. You do it little by little. So let's say that... Um, oh, off the top of my head. Let's say a group of you gather together and you're going to have pizzas and somebody has decided they're in charge of the pizzas, so they'll bring them all. Great. And every one of those pizzas is disgusting. <laughs> and you look at them, and you think, oof, oof. Ah, here comes your opportunity to abandon yourself, to surrender yourself, to lose yourself. Take a big slice, it won't kill you. Take a big slice of that and eat it with a smile. You'll have done your soul more good than you realise. And let's say someone you can't stand, I'm deliberately saying that because it's easy, with people that we, we love it's real easy. Let's say somebody you can't stand decides to come up and talk to you. And everything in you says, oh, get lost. Ah, here's your opportunity to lose yourself, to abandon yourself, and to say to God, I give you this. It's a secret between you and me. Stand there, smile, engage, and ju just don't talk. Just don't talk meaningfully talk. Ask that person about him or herself. Walk away from there having truly encountered that person. You'll have done more good for your soul than you realise. And don't just do it in Lent. Do it right through the year. <laughs> yeah, even today... But look, I'll tell you what, you'll, be le you'll leave here after finishing listening to me. And by golly, I better hurry up. I haven't got to the main deal yet. Um, <laughs> before you leave this auditorium, God will have presented you with an opportunity. Take it. You know that wonderful story of St Philip Neri? He had a fab famously revolting temper. And he asked God, do something about it. And he thought he had it clinched by just saying to God, you come on, do something. So he went outside of the chapel after he'd just spoken to God and along came one of the brothers and Philip Neri ripped him to pieces. So he went storming back into the chapel and he said to God, I thought I asked you to help me. And God said, yeah, I just gave you an opportunity. Well, God will give you loads of opportunities too. All right, now... I'll leave the rest of that. What will you discover if you really take this interior life seriously? Well, here's some of the things you'll discover. Ah. Exhibit A, which I hid over here.
<laughs> Somewhere in my pocket is what I stole from the kitchen this morning. It's, it's beautifully stolen. It's even in a kitchen plastic glove. Right. All right. You're going to live the interior life. You're going to put into your life all those things we've just been speaking about. Yeah, okay. I got an old bottle thinking to myself... Excuse me. Thinking I, I won't open up, open up, ah, open up a new bottle. Got the stuff all over me, but it's all right. All right, now watch this. Here's you. You want God, and I presume you want God, or you wouldn't be here right now. You're prepared to put into your life all those things we just spoke about on account of you want God, on account of you want you're going to abandon yourself to God in order to discover the God who has already abandoned himself to you. He got in way ahead of you. So you do all those things. You eat broccoli when you can't stand it and you do it for the love of God, etc. And bit by bit you go on about your work, you go about your life and into that you add some more of all those things we've just been talking about and notice I'm not even bothering to look at this because I'm busy looking at you. You know, that's a mistake we make about God sometimes. We forget that God is busy looking at you. It's this marvellous story. Basil Hume, Cardinal Basil Hume, Benedictine. He might have been Cardinal, Archbishop, whatever he was of Westminster, but he was a Benedictine monk. And uh, he used to go every Friday and visit this woman. She was, you know, housebound, bedbound. And the deal was he'd go to the house, he'd be greeted at the door by the woman's daughter. He'd go in, speak to the woman, and um, then come out and his, the daughter would have a cup of tea ready for him and they'd have a cup of tea and off he'd go. There was a picture in the dining in the lounge room there it was revolting. It was a picture of Jesus until you, it wasn't flattering at all to Jesus. Um, artistically, it was dreadful. And every time Basil saw it, he thought, oh, yuck, that is so terrible. Underneath were the words, he's watching you. <laughs> and all Basil could think about was his mother saying to him, God's watching you. Anyway, he was just thinking that very thought when in came the woman with the tea and she said, oh, Father, don't you love this picture? <laughs> now, fortunately, before he could open his mouth, she said, I love it and I love this bit here, he's watching you, because I think, yeah, that's right. He loves me so much, he can't take his eyes off me. That's God. Look what happened. You are no longer you. There's been a change. And the change is God. The interior life will call you out of yourself. You will no longer... You might tell a lie, but by golly, pretty quickly, you'll realise you did it. Because truth comes with this, you'll discover that the will of God in your life means more to you than your own will. You'll discover that you can no longer leave an aching person on their own. You can't do it. 
Dorothy Day, who you'll hear more about one day, because she's on her way to sainthood, had the same experience. She couldn't leave the poor of New York on their own once she'd encountered God. You can't do it. Furthermore, everything will begin to speak to you about God. You know, there were loads of people romping around Israel in the time of Jesus, about, and, and loads of people who saw flowers hanging out in the paddocks. But only Jesus said, see those? They're just like the glory of your souls created by my Father. Loads of people saw, saw birds flying over too. But only Jesus said, see them? You can buy two of those for next to nothing in the market. But you're worth more than many sparrows. It is a truth. Get into the interior life and everything will speak to you about God. And furthermore, they'll be the words you need. More so, when the hard times come, and they will come, the interior life is not a guarantee that you're going to have a so straight run. Far from it. God will pay you the courtesy of being real with you. And so when the hard times come, if you're living an interior life, you will know that those hard times are merely the precursor of the divine. They're just like, you know, how John the Baptist came and he said, hey, God's coming. Hard times are just telling you God is sending something wonderful and right now is preparing my heart and soul to receive it. Hang in there. And if you've got an interior life, you will. Furthermore, um, I want to say this too along those lines. If you've got an interior life, then you can pray for faith and you'd be darn sure you will encounter doubt. Pray for hope. Be darn sure that you'll encounter despair. Pray for love. And you'll be darn sure that you will counter everything that is unlovable. That's how it works. Now, there's more. And I want to say to you that this is really what the world needs now. It needs people like you who take the interior life seriously. So you'll give yourself away. Good eh? Whoops. Um, if you um, if somebody wants to know why there's blue stuff up here, you know nothing, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you give yourself away. Look. What's happening? You're becoming deeper. You are becoming more truly the image of God than you already are the image of God. This is what the world needs right now. I dare say, I'll go further and say... And this is what you need right now. Um, one last comment, because time really has caught up with us, so I'm leaving some stuff here. You know, when I say this is what the world needs now, I cringe when I hear world leaders say things like, you know, there's been a terrorist attack or something, and those responsible will be brought to justice. And I think, oh, what? Couldn't you have said those responsible will be brought to forgiveness? If you've got an interior life, forgiveness is your first, one of your first ports of call. I want to say to you, take this on for the individuals that God has created you to be. Don't try and be another Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Vincent de Paul. God's already got one of those. He doesn't need two. 
He needs you. Yes, the world is made of, has got canonised saints in it, but what we really, 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 really forget is that the world is populated with the uncanonised saints, with the people who live this day after day after day and who are so close to the heart of God. Be, go out from here and be your kind of saint, God's kind of saint. All right, now, as I've said, I've left a heck of a lot out, but I'm going to ask you to do this. Just close your eyes for a minute. All right, you've been beautifully listening. Your heart, your soul's been listening. What has God said to you? in the last 45 minutes. And when you realise what it is that he said, give him incredible joy. Thank him and talk to him just for a little minute about what it is he's given you. Thank you so much, Mother Hilda.